Hello, beautiful people. Welcome. <laughs> My name is Alicia Renice, and I'm so happy that you are here. Today, we're going to be talking about hair. This seems kind of off-brand a little bit, but who cares? We talk about what we want. <laughs> we do what we want here, okay? We do what brings us joy and a source of joy and also pain and frustration and ridicule, right, has been my hair. Um, I really struggled with where to start with this video. Where do I begin, right? And so to start, I'm gonna start from the start, from the beginning. Um, the relationship that I've had with my hair started as a child, as a child. So I'm gonna take it all the way back to in the 90s, early 90s, when I first became aware that hair was supposed to be a source of pride for me. Um, shout out to African Pride. <laughs> Um, if you are a black woman, you probably know that phrase, stop touching your hair, um, stop, sit still, stop complaining, right? Um, you're tender headed, all these different things, right? That were told as a child. And so my earliest memories, and they're very fond to me, sitting in between my mother's legs, holding a bowl of hot water <laughs> and having a bottle of pink stuff on the side with sulfur eight, right? And pink stuff, I think was just called like Luster's Pink Lotion, but we called it pink stuff in this house. <laughs> and so my mother would take a brush dip it into the hot water and brush my hair and brush my hair, of course, combing it first, but brushing it into ponytails and barrettes. And then I would have like two little pigtails on either side and two in the back or one big one in the back. And that was a source of care for me. But it was also a, a source of trauma. Um, I guess I could call myself tender headed. Right. And so as a kid, <laughs> when you're complaining about getting your hair done, nobody wants to hear about that. Number one. Right. Because your mom or whoever's doing your hair is also struggling with doing her hair and also yours. Right. So while someone is caretaking for you, they're doing the caretaking and that is labor. That's time. And so sometimes I got the overflow from my mother's frustration or my aunt's frustration with doing my hair. And this was the first time that I heard the word coarse coarse like your hair is coarse my mother tells me how my grandfather her father would make fun of her hair and you know in a loving way but he would always say to her your hair is coarse girl right and she'll tell the story and she would always say to her father no it's not no it's not it's not coarse right as little kids do but I remember sitting there thinking oh my hair is difficult right and what did that translate to me that my being my very being the hair that grows out of my scalp is difficult, therefore I am difficult. I am a source of inconvenience, right? I am a source of labor. And so as I sat between the thighs of my aunt or my mom or another hairdresser, right? Like I would try to sit still because I understood that they were putting work into me. And sometimes that, that feeling of being a burden turned to shame. <laughs> and so I have notes <laughs> because I've been, I've been journaling about this experience and like, what is it? What's going on? So one of the first things that getting my hair done as a child, like before I got a perm with natural hair, right? You are difficult. Your hair is difficult. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of labor. Sit still, be quiet, silence your pain, right? Your pain and your frustration with your scalp is less important than the person doing your hair, giving you the care, right? And it also um, is interesting. We call people tenderheaded, right? And we often only say this to black girls, to black girls, like you're tender headed. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're responding to pain from you pulling their hair from their scalp. And, and we're taught from a young age that pain equals beauty, that pain equals, is, is what is the cost of joy? To have that fresh hair, right? The fresh hair style when you're walking into the school or whatever, or wherever you're going, right? Pain is the requirement. And so even as a child, it kind of primes us and preps us to be abused. It primes us to, and, 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 and prepares us to experience a lot of pain and to see that as normal. So even as a kid, when you're hearing your hair is coarse and it's difficult and they're like ripping, you know, the hair out of your scalp, we're being taught that we don't deserve to be treated with kind, soft, gentle, tender, patient hands. And oftentimes those hands were not patient because our parents, our caretakers, them, they themselves were also not being cared for and also not being uh, treated gently and kindly. And so we got, we got the overflow from that. Um, but as a kid in general, I was free. I didn't care. I did not care about my hair. <laughs> I did, obviously, I did not care about my hair. My mother would take care of it. Other people would take care of it. But it was not a source of like, it wasn't like my focus. I wasn't really focused on how I showed up as a youth. And I'm talking like five and under, right? So I was free. I didn't care about my hair, right? And I wasn't aware of hair um, as being something to judge yourself with. I didn't, I didn't understand that hair was linked to respectability politics because who even knew what that was back then, okay? 
Um, that was not a conversation in my household. <laughs> but I knew that walking out the house, I had to look like something, right? You got to look like something when you leave this house because when you leave this house, you represent not only your home, but all of us, right? And what a weight for a five-year-old girl to carry on her shoulders who just wants to go outside and play and to rough house <laughs> and to, to play football with the boys or whatever you're doing, right? To go on adventures in the woods and to rescue kittens. What, what weight we put on our kids like you have to look like something because people are judging you and your worth and your value is wrapped up and packaged in how you present yourself to the world so even as a child even though I didn't have the words for it I still understood that even though I didn't care about it I had to care that other people cared about it if that makes sense okay so so I said how long does a little girl's body belong to her you know what I mean? Like, really think about that. How long do we get to be silly children making mistakes, you know, before, you know, we got to put on the good Sunday clothes or the good Sunday shoes or especially if you if you experience poverty um, or limited resources like we did. We were shopping at thrift stores. Right. And so even though we were buying, you know, secondhand things, there was still pressure to make those secondhand things last and to make those secondhand things look like something. So even as a child being taught that I should care about what other people think about me and my body and my hair. So that's where I want to start. <laughs> but again, also getting my hair done, right, was a, was an act of care. Like, I loved being cared for. Falling asleep on your mother's uh, thigh while she's doing your hair, right? These kinds of things. But also being still enough, right, to respect and honor the person giving you the care for your hair. And I also realized, looking back, I was not tenderheaded. I was a child, and I'm human, and I feel pain just like everybody else does. But because we are forcing our little baby's hair into these barrettes and these ponytails, right? The pulling, the, the pulling hurts. The braiding so closely to the scalp, it hurts, right? And because we, we're braiding tightly because we want these braids to last. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like we want these braids to last. And so we're teaching our kids that they are the problem. Their response to pain is the problem. That they should, that if you keep doing this, you'll get used to it. That you'll become numb to this pain. And as a tender-headed child, I did not. It still hurt. It still caused me pain. But it taught me to swallow my pain because I didn't want to frustrate those doing my hair. You know, and if this is the cost of beauty, then I got to be willing to pay it. You know? Chapter two. <laughs> if it's burning, it's working. So this is about a perm. <laughs> So I don't know what age I was. I should have asked my mom before I did, I did this. But at a very young age, my mother gave me a perm. And I'm not blaming her for it, right? It was the 90s. She was busy. She was a boss, right? Like she was taking care of our home and all this other stuff. She didn't have the time or energy, right, to put the effort in to keep doing my natural hair, my coarse hair, as it grew out of my head. So she gave me a perm. Unaware, obviously, at this point, we know uh, the effects of those chemicals that we put on our body, right? But we had no idea. We were just doing the best that we could with what we had. And so just for me, just for me, came <laughs> into my life. And every time you got the box, you would look at the girls on the front of the box and be like, I want my hair to look like her. Like, this must be what beauty is. And if my hair is not shiny and straight and silky and healthy like hers or thick, right, dense like hers, then it's not pretty, Right. And so if you're like me and you grew up in the 90s or to maybe even to early 2000s, there used to be a cassette that came with it with the instructions and you would put it in the cassette player and there'd be a girl singing just for me. That was my favorite part of the whole thing. It taught me that my hair is coarse and I never knew that my hair was difficult until I got my perm. Until someone said, you know, we're going to put this on there to straighten it to make it easier because it's not like I was getting my hair pressed you know, or straightened to wear to, to elementary school. No, my mom said that was too grown. <laughs> what she got a perm, the reason why she got a perm was to make it easier, the process easier for her to do my hair, right? And so I understand it, I honor it, right? But it also taught me like the way that my hair goes out of my hair is wrong somehow, that it needs to be fixed, that it needs to be fixed with this cream relaxer. Speaking of cream relaxer, I used to get sometimes, it would burn my scalp, right? And so I would get these scabs in my scalp um, that would flake off, you know, after a week or so of the perm. Um, but it just was not a pleasurable experience because you're putting chemicals on your hair and it's burning your scalp. And the whole time I thought like, oh, if it says no lie, then it's fine. But no, like you're putting chemicals on your hair and burning the scalp of children. Right. And I thank God like that. I still have a full head of hair because when I tell you the scabs were there sometimes and even I got scabs sometimes when people would braid too tightly. That's a whole other thing. But anyway. 
getting a perm, again, taught me that my hair is coarse and my hair is wrong and I am wrong and I have things about me that need to be fixed so that it's easier for me for people to deal with me, but also so I look prettier because I got way more compliments when my hair was straight than I did when it was when it was like shrinking and coarse and close to my head, coily. Yeah, my mom seemed to be working hard doing my hair and it was hard work. <laughs> I got thick hair, okay? <laughs> I got thick hair, we all got thick hair. But it was seen as a problem because we were all so busy. We were also overwhelmed. There was no time for self-care, you know, when I was growing up. There was no real self-care. I think that we sought self-care in the way that we could. And perming was a way um, to experience self-care in a way because it made the process easier, right? Um, but what did it teach me? It taught me that my hair is a burden, that work and care of my hair and therefore myself is a burden, right? That I was only beautiful when my hair was processed, pressed, or straight. Sunday's best that I was not worth the time it took to care for myself, right? It took me so long to do my hair naturally. It took my mother so long, right? And ease and convenience was not a part of that process. Like doing my natural hair was not easy, nor was it convenient. Um, and we didn't know what we know now. There wasn't a lot of like hair education like that we see on YouTube. Like what we have now is a privilege. It was not like that. You were just kind of on your own in the 90s or you were living off of the wisdom of your ancestors or your parents or your grandparents or whoever, right? The person that has growing hands in your community. Other than that, you're kind of on your own. You're doing what you can with what you got, right? <laughs> so, so you know what I'm saying? So we were just out here just try trying to figure it out. And I think my mother was just trying to figure it out. And she was also going through her own stuff and gave me a perm. Um, so I don't blame her for this. I just, these are just things that I had to think about and sit down with, right? Um, it also taught me that beauty is pain. When they would say, oh, the, the more it burns, the better it's working. Or keep it in. The longer you keep it in, the better it'll work, right? All along, I'm burning. I'm uncomfortable, right? I'm a child. It hurts. But I'm like, okay, so, but you're saying on the other end of this is beauty, is acceptance, right? Is, are all the things that I want, like love, appreciation, like I wanted to be pretty, you know, like the girls on the box, the little girls on the box. And I just I mourn for that version of me because I don't think that kids that age should be thinking about beauty at all. You know what I'm saying? The beauty industry does a does a great job with by preying on our insecurities to make themselves money, you know, and they will start at the youngest age possible. They will they will tell little girls to care about and little boys to care about how they're looked at and consumed. They're taught, they're teaching little girls to be consumed. And I even look at this, I made a, a podcast about how the girls are in Sephora, like 10 year olds in Sephora using like acids on their faces and things like this. Like they're preying on little girls insecurity and little girls want to be loved. You know what I mean? And so I feel like just for me was that same kind of energy. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you want to be like the girls. You want to be the popular girl. You want to be the pretty girl. Get this perm and everything will be given to you. You know what I mean? But again, the burning, <laughs> the burning to endure. It's teaching little girls, little black girls to endure pain, to stay in the process that on the other end, you'll get acceptance from people, but it's going to be a painful process to get there. And I see this reflected in my life today. A lot of times I endure a lot thinking that what's on the other side of this pain is worth it. And oftentimes it's not. Um, but I think like, oh, this is the way like because life, little convenience is like hair because hair is made to be a painful process too, then of course I'm going to think relationships are supposed to be painful. Of course I'm going to think staying at a job is supposed to suck, right? When you're young and you're prime to accept suffering as the cost for convenience or for joy or for pleasure or for love, then again, it's going to be reflected in every area of your life, right? So what I'm learning from, I'm learning from my hair, you know, I'm learning from the journey of my hair and going back to those times and saying, hey, where did I accept that pain equals love, that pain does equal beauty? Who said this and why do we believe it? Right. And why do black girls and black women have to suffer more than anybody to obtain this love and to be seen as beautiful? Why are we working against our bodies, even at, a such, even at such a young age? Why are we working against our bodies to be seen as beautiful, destroying our bodies, destroying our hair? to be seen as beautiful and as enough? You know, these are just questions. This is not a judgment. These are just things for, that I think about. Um, so yeah, so the process, right? Just for me perms came with a tape and pictures of little girls with blowouts. So whole time, this, I forgot to say this. Whole time, the girls did not have a perm. Whole time, these girls didn't even use the relaxer. So we are chasing, we were chasing unrealistic expectations on the box perm. 
right? Wondering why we're not getting the same results. Why doesn't my hair flow that way? Girl, because their hair is not, their hair is not permed. <laughs> their hair is natural. <laughs> That's another conversation for another day. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so yes. Um, it set unrealistic expectations for beauty, even for little girls, right? And so the process of the perm. Okay, so when I got a perm, this is what I remember. You had to wait until your hair was dirty, right? You had to wait until your hair was dirty because you're going to put chemicals on it and it needs as much debris and dirt to protect your scalp and your hair from being destroyed, right? So your hair's dirty. Then I remember my, my mother sectioning off my hair and putting like Vaseline on my ears and on my, uh, what do you call it? The, the line of my forehead and into my temples, like, you know, the edges so that it would protect the edges. Um, then I remember her dividing the hair into sections and applying the perm from the tip to the root, the tip to the root. Then at some point it's done, right? The application process is finished. You put your hair up, like off of your back, off of your ears, and you just wait. You wait, you sit there, and at some point you start feeling a little tingling, a little tingling, right? Because it's chemicals. <laughs> you, start, you start feeling that tingling in your scalp and you're like, huh, I think it's working. And then it intens intensifies, right? And then at some point you're like, this is uncomfortable. And you may raise your hand and say to your mom, this burns. And your mom or whoever may say to you, that's because it's working. That's because it's working, right? And it taught me that to be beautiful in the ways of whiteness was painful. To be beautiful, to be seen as beautiful through a white lens, through the, through the male gaze, the white lens, right? The white gaze is painful. It's causing me to denaturize my hair. Like, just think about this. Being seen as beautiful costs us so much. The denaturization of our hair, it's literally losing the kink and the curl that it came with. And also, I'm not judging those who get perms, right? But this is just a thought. Why do we have to subject ourselves to so much pain and all the chemicals, right, just to be seen as good enough to white people? to white people. And obviously, again, this was the 90s. So there was no Crown Act. There was no movement, right, for the freedom and liberation of black women in that way that I saw as a youth. I'm sure they existed, but I didn't have access to them. And um, so my mother was also playing the game because she was working around in these spaces where, with white people and having to present herself in a way. And I think that she wanted to afford that same opportunity to me, right? So even that was an act of love. So I'm not faulting her for it. I'm blaming the system that made us fold and, and bend in ways that are unnatural to us to fit their idea of beauty and excellence and all these other things, you know? It's heartbreaking because it's never enough. Even when I got the perm, even when I got the perm, I was still clowned. <laughs> even, even I did all that work and I was still clowned and my hair was still in a ponytail, right? Like, and it just was never enough. There was always something else to achieve. There was also always something else to aspire to, to be seen as enough or beautiful or beautiful, right? Um, to be beautiful in the ways of whiteness is painful and it's heartbreaking because, like I said, it's never enough, right? And it's painful in general. Then you'll be loved, right? And it taught me that the journey to love is painful. It set the foundation that the journey to be loved and valued and cared for is a painful process, is a painful process. At seven years old, you shouldn't even be concerned with how people are consuming you because you're not here to be consumed. You're seven, you're a child, but even as a child, I was very aware. I was, I was made aware very early on that there is a standard of beauty and I don't fit that standard of beauty, even at seven years old, right? I wasn't even who I was gonna be <laughs> at seven, you know? Like, I'm still new here and I'm still concerning myself with, with the ways of the world and how they perceive beauty and who is worthy of love and acceptance and, and all these other things, right? It was just very, very, very toxic very toxic um yes like my hair was being tamed at that age that's what I wrote down in my journal my hair at that age but I realized I was being tamed at that age right sit still swallow your pain right um get your hair to look like this it should be straight instead of like coiled and curly and close to your head you know I was being tamed I had parts of myself that were being stripped away at that time too I'm at seven there are a lot of traumatic things that happened to me and I had to grow up really really fast um that was also the year of my brother's my little brother's birth um and it felt like after he was born and this is obviously like not his fault but um, my parents were going through it right and so I had to be the person I had to be, the, whatever that meant, I had to be the person, you know? And so your youth is kind of taken from you very early on when you're made aware of traumatic things and, and happenings in your family. 
And so parts of myself are being cut off right? Along with my hair being permed over and over again, tamed over and over again, pain all over again. And you're just quiet about it. And you don't tell anybody about it. And, you know, things happen to you. People mishandle you. People assault you. You don't say anything because you think pain is normal. Like this is your, this is your ground zero is pain, you know? And so it makes your tolerance for pain greater than that of other people and so you just start to say like oh well it's normal yeah that person put hands on me but it's normal this person assaulted me or um betrayed me it's normal right this is what I should be accepting this is what I should be accepting right and it made me it made me resent my natural hair and indoctrinated me to see it as unruly (laughs) as unruly and it even caused me to be ashamed of it I don't know if y'all remember for those of you who had a perm Um, Maybe after like week two, you start feeling the new growth and you're like, oh, no. Right. You feel new growth. Your hair's growing. Your hair's growing as it was designed to grow out of your head like this. Right. You start to feel it and you say to yourself, oh, no. Oh, no. Even that response to hair growing is crazy at seven. You're like, oh, no, by week two, like something is wrong. Right. It made me resent my own hair. It made me resent myself. It made me resent the natural process of growing, (laughs) of being a human, like the biological process of hair growing out of your scalp. It made me resentful towards myself. It made me resentful towards the natural things about me, the things that people started to say that they hated. I started perming and restricting and muting those parts of myself because I wanted so desperately to be loved. Like finally, if I cut this off, I'll be loved. Then it was something else. Okay, well, fine. I'll cut this off too. Then I'll be loved. Okay. Then I'll swallow that pain. I won't say anything about that. Then I'll be loved. I won't talk about my interests. Then I'll be loved. So I started to shape myself and fashion myself um, in a way that I thought would get me love and acceptance, you know, and it, it never panned out well. (laughs) It never panned out well, by the way, because at some point your natural self is going to resent you to be like, why don't you think that we're enough? This part that you're playing, you can only play it for so long. The mask slips or you start to teach yourself that you're not worthy of love and acceptance. You know, in either way, it's awful. Either way. Um, Yeah. So my hair fought like hell to be herself. Right. And every six weeks she was relaxed again. So my hair growing out of my scalp, like fought like, no, I will be seen. I will be loved and relax. I will be loved and relax right and then again that two week period we're like dang like it doesn't last long it doesn't last long because it's not natural it was not for you right so um yeah it reminded it made me resent my new growth reminding me of who I really am and um and the part of me that I was trying to hide she always reared her head some way and I resented her for that um yeah this was also the beginning of my people pleasing era Again, cutting off myself and trying to be who I need to be to be loved and protected and seen as worthy and to be validated. This was the beginning of people pleasing for me. And it started with my hair. I stuffed the parts of me that went unseen and unloved deep down, deep, deep, deep down. Duty to people and pleasing became my perm. And it kept me tame. And the pain and fear of rejection was far too great. The pain of rejection hurt worse than that burning right? That, that hurrying up and rinsing out in the kitchen sink. Um, it, it hurt worse than the hot comb on the back of the neck. It felt worse than, you know, the braiding or the pulling, right? The pulling of the edges. That rejection had me, like the fear of rejection had me in such a chokehold that I was willing to do anything to become anybody, to be seen and loved and appreciated. And, and, and there were, and appreciated. And there were awful things also happening at home where I felt like I wasn't being seen because other things were seen as more important. Um, people were stressed about money, all the things. Right. So I wanted so desperately to be loved. And I thought that this was the way pain was the way. So this stage was around 11 to 14, like middle school, elementary school, getting into high school. I started to realize what beauty looked like for adult black women. I would watch music videos. Um, I remember vividly watching the, the Ludacris um, I Wanna. It's far too young to watch that, by the way. But watching um, Ludacris's video and all these other rappers and then platforming video vixens, right? Women who were in videos and they were gorgeous. They were beautiful, right? And they were, they were bold and sexy and they were wanted and desired. And at that age, 13, 14, you start to understand desirability. You start to understand like, oh, and probably even before that, maybe like 10, to be completely honest with you. Um, you start to understand desirability and you understand what is desired and what is not, what is made fun of. 
Shout out to all the songs of the early 2000s. Chicken head, you a bald headed scallywag, ain't got no hair in the back, gelled up, weaved up, your hair looks messed up, right? That line <laughs> was so humiliating, right? As a black woman, you didn't want to be that girl. You didn't want to be the girl with gelled hair in the back, right? With a weave that people can tell that it's a weave. Mind you, we're children in elementary school. But you don't want to be the girl with the weave that people can tell. You don't want to be the girl with the ponytail, with the little, the, the back hair sticking out, right? You don't want to be the girl with the rough kitchen, right? You know what I'm saying? The thick kitchen. You, y'all know what I'm talking about. So these songs are making it very clear to us what was seen as beautiful. Then hearing those lyrics, seeing the women in the videos, right? The, the women in the videos with the long hair, the light skin, the light eyes, right? The thin frame, but curvy in the right parts. For a tall girl who is skinny, very, very skinny. Okay, made fun of, like my cousins would, my cousins would make fun of me. I would sit on their laps when we were in the car. First of all, the 90s was a wild time. We'd be in the back of the car illegally sitting on people's laps. It is what it is. We're okay. We're here. Um, and like our family was doing the best that they could do with what they got. And they would make fun of me and say like, oh, you know, I can feel your bones in my thighs. And it probably was true. Right. But I just felt so like ugly. I felt so ugly. Um, and I was like, I want a big butt. I want boobs. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, w- I want these things. Calm down, little Alicia. It's going to come. And it's more work than not. But anyway, (laughs) Um, when I was a kid, I was like, I want to be beautiful. I want to be these girls in the videos. And so I was getting my perms. And so I was trying to start wearing them out, right? My mom was not having that. She thought that was too grown. But I was trying to wear it out. And with me trying to make my hair like the girls in the videos, my hair started breaking off. My hair started breaking off. I don't know if it was because of the perms or like, I have no idea. Maybe because I wasn't upkeeping it well, but it was starting to break. And that broke my heart because I'm like, I need long hair to be pretty. I need to be lighter to be pretty. So in- intro to colorism and texturism and featureism and all these different things I didn't have words for at the time, but I felt it very strongly. Um, when I was younger, my grandmommy gave me a subscription to Essence Magazine and no ebony i think it was ebony magazine and in there were some ads for um color contacts there were ads for uh you know like texturizers perms all those different things and and there were light-skinned women in the ads right because desirability and i would cut out women from the magazines and put them together and i would pray to god every night to make me look like this like god please i want to look like this woman this made-up woman with these with these hazel eyes and light skin and curves in the right places and you know like I was I was begging God to make me beautiful to make me this idea of beauty that was sold to me um and I weep for that little girl because oh she was so precious right but that messaging was everywhere about what was beautiful it was even infiltrating my elementary school and my middle school I remember as a child being told that I was too masculine can you imagine Oh my gosh. I was told I was too masculine. I was made fun of for my for my smile, right? When I smile, my upper lip curls in. I love my smile now, but at the time I hated it. I was like, I people call me say that I look like a horse or a monkey. Like it was just it was such a depressing time to be alive for me. <laughs> you know? Um, and I couldn't I didn't see myself in any of the people that people called beautiful. You know what I mean? And so I was like, well then I must not be beautiful. That's just what it is. Um so me, as long as I had brown skin, as long as I was tall and thin, or as long as I had the smile like this, as long as my eyes were brown, like brown, brown, like my eyes are brown, brown. And I love that about me now. But at the time I hated it. I was like, there's nothing special about me. There's nothing that makes me pretty. You know, I'm just basic black, which is wild to say, but that's how I felt. Like there's nothing, everybody that was like popular in my school, they were light skinned or they were like witty or they had a mouth on them. So you wasn't finna talk to them any kind of way. I was not that girl. <laughs> I, was, I was sensitive. I was loving. And sadly, that made me the target for a lot of, you know, um, bullying for a lot of name calling and all I want to do was love people and to be loved and it just was not working out for me it was not working out for your girl so so I have the words now I didn't have it back then I knew what it felt like and now that feeling is familiar I can understand what it was right but at the time featureism and texturism was a big thing I didn't think that anything about me was beautiful but I also recognize that I don't look like these girls who are being praised as beautiful so therefore I must not be (laughs) I tried to wear my hair like them and it started breaking off, like I said, and my true self wanted to be seen and loved. So there was a time like 
during this process of me getting a perm where my hair was breaking off right at the po- at the point where the permed hair met the natural hair, right? So it would just break off, like literally just break off, like fall off um, because I guess one was weaker than the other. And I guess if you keep perming your hair over and over and over again, again, we were not um, beauticians, okay? We're just using box perms. And I think with reusing it over and over again, it made the hair weaker, right? It made the hair weaker. So when the weak, false version of myself met the natural, strong version, what is going to win? That natural hair. (laughs) The natural hair started winning, okay? The hair started shedding, and something had to be done. Something had to change. And at 14 years old, my freshman year in high school, I had my big first chop. My big first chopped. Um, first chop. A lot of people talk about their first chop with like, oh yeah, I was empowered and I was excited and I was confident. I was scared. I was scared. I went to a high school where people would make fun of you. I went to, you know, you know, you know, you know, I went to black schools. It is what it is. I love us. And the way that we show love is by teasing each other. I'm too sensitive for that. I don't like being teased. I never did. I never liked it. It's not funny to me. (laughs) So, um, I'm also the girl who wore high waters because I was growing like crazy and like nothing fit my body. Um, I would be wearing white socks. Poor bless you, Alicia. You did the best you could. <laughs> but I'll be wearing white socks with these uniform pants, these blue pants. Um, and it wasn't until I started playing sports and getting sweat pants that I could like, OK, I can kind of blend in. But before that, people were making fun of me. People were calling me nuts. I was also very weird, you know, as I am now. It is what it is. And people didn't understand that. So me cutting off my hair, it's just it's just further like social suicide. That's what it felt like. I was like, oh, my God, they're going to drag me. Just during this time, I was just starting volleyball as a freshman. This is like the fall of 2004. I met this woman named Takesha, this girl named Takesha, and she was a senior at the time. Takesha took me under her wing in a lot of ways, and I'm still so thankful for her. She saw me, um, and she loved me well, and her sister did hair. So when I told her I was cutting off of my hair because it's just breaking off, um, her sister volunteered to braid my hair. So first she was braiding my hair with, um, with my perm and my natural hair, but eventually she talked me into cutting off my hair. And I fought her on it for a long time. I'm like, no, like I need my length. Like I want to keep it. And she's like, girl, like it's not, it's not healthy. And honestly, there's more options for you if your hair is natural. So now that I had actually community care, which was essential, I had someone who does hair. Like this is what she does. I had community care and she had the energy and the time to put into care for me. Now I'm like, okay, cool. Let's do this. Let's see what we can do, right? So we cut off my hair. My hair was very short. And she put braids in my hair for the first time. This was like the first time I had like braids with extensions in it, like um, Kinecolon or Kinkalon. I never know if I'm saying that right. But either way, I got the packs. She put it in my hair. And for once, I felt cared for. I felt like someone else can do this. Like somebody can take the burden of doing my hair and caring for me. Like that, that same feeling you got when you sat in between your parents or your caregivers, you know, legs for them to do your hair and you fall asleep on their, on their lap. It's that same feeling of care and kindness. And she was so gentle with me, right? And she was reaffirming me. Oh, I love her. Bless her. And she was reaffirming me and and letting me know, like, you're not the problem. Here's some products to use. Here's some things. You have to comb the middle of your head, (laughs) right? And at the time, I didn't have the energy or the, or the, uh, I didn't have the energy to do all that. And she did it for me. She did it for me. And it felt so good to be cared for. And I think that a lot of us are missing, um, care, community care from other people, community care from other caregivers, right? When we're doing everything by ourselves, of course, we're going to be overwhelmed. There were times that I was doing my hair during um, middle school and and high school where I was like crying. I was crying. Like I'd be combing my hair and I'd get so frustrated and like just start like ripping my hair out, you know, with the brush and the comb. And I would just sit on the floor and cry, like silent cry, because like it was just so overwhelming for me. It was just so much. Um, And it really showed me ritual it really showed me care like that was like one of my first like my earliest memories of like community care in that way um the resource that Takesha was to to link me to her sister and to help her sister make money because my mom paid for my hair to get done for her sister to make money for me to be cared for so that I can have some confidence I can have some something about me you know like I didn't have to suffer alone because I had sisterhood um and I want to read this I want to read this quote that I found um it's by um Dr. Afia M. M.B. Lashaka, I'm pretty sure I'm saying that wrong. Please forgive me. Um, But her quote about getting your hair done in the context of of black women doing each other's hair, I really want to share this quote. So it says, 
I think getting our hair done is a ritual. In a ritual, you are preparing your mind, body, and spirit to receive a blessing. Ooh. So through her experience in studying beauty rituals in Africa, she saw from birth to death that people have to wear their hair in a certain hairstyle to achieve a spiritual goal, right? So in Ghana, for example, girls become women once they master a hairstyle. And it's a physical expression to the whole community um, that they are now women. And in certain parts of West Africa, when your hair is not done, it symbolizes to your community that you need support, that you need support. Some even go as far as cutting or shaving their hair off so others are forced to look at their head, which is a symbol for their mind and mental health or mental health, right? And so I, I, when I read that, I was so taken with that. Like we, in the States, in the West, um, we tend to criticize and ridicule women for not being kept up, right? For not having her things about her. But if she doesn't have the resources, the money, if she doesn't have the time, the understanding, the knowledge, right? If she doesn't have the ability to apply what she has learned or even like the time to learn her own hair because all hair is not the same, right? They have different textures. I have like three different textures of hair in my head, okay? The back of my hair, the kitchen is actually not the kitchen. It's one of the straightest parts of my hair. The front is also kind of loose. The middle though, you're talking about that big back section, okay? That's where, that's where my kitchen is. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so having, like, even as my hair is short, I have a cowlick back here. My hair goes in a totally different direction in the back of my head. So it always looks longer than it is. Um, but, yeah, like, shout out to the ancestors. Like, I'm carrying their hair story in my own head, right? But I thought it was beautiful because we criticize women for not appearing put together, for, like, wearing a bonnet outside or for, you know, not having their hair done or, oh, she look a mess. Look at her hair. Look at her tracks. Look at her, look at her, um, look at her thing lifting. Like, we say these things, right? And we don't, one, who cares? You shouldn't be saying that. You shouldn't be doing that, right, number one. But two, maybe this is a call for care. Maybe people, like, I know when I'm going through it, when I am going through a depressive episode, hair is the last thing I'm concerned about. I put on a head wrap. I put on a bonnet, a hat. I'm not concerning myself with my hair because it's just going to send me further into despair <laughs> because nobody is taking care of me. I'm taking care of me. Right. And I think we should have far more grace with black women specifically um, in general, but also about their hair. Like our hair has been such a topic of ridicule and like uh, like even in some places we weren't even allowed to show our hair. Right. Because of how it grows out of our scalp scalp in, in professional settings, it's still seen as unprofessional. We'll get to that in a second. But it seems unprofessional. There are laws still trying to be passed in the year 2024. Okay, 2024. We're still trying to pass laws to say that black folks get to have their hair grow out of their hair like they want to. Every every so often there's an article that comes up. A boy has to cut his locks off before he wrestles. A boy has to has to cut his locks off before he crosses and graduates. A girl was sent home because her hair was not done in their mind. Right. Like these constant things when this is an invitation for care for community. I know even as a person who suffers with depression, wanting to cut off my hair sometimes is a sign that I need a break. I'm tired, right? Like, I, I don't have the energy to do my hair. Everybody's criticizing me about it, but you're not doing it, so I'm going to cut it off, right? And how beautiful it is that community comes together to care for this person. They see the person needing help. Like, no, I got you, sis. I got you, sis. I got you. Come here. Let me take care of you. Since you can't take care of yourself right now, let me take care of you. And shaving their heads, right, as a symbol for their mind and their mental health. Like, they're ailing. How can we serve each other? How can we support one another, you know? And so she goes on to say, hair can be this language system that lets other people know how you feel and who you are. So when your hair doesn't get to look the way you want, then you are not communicating to other people how you feel. Right. So, again, I'm going to read this. Hair can be this language system that lets other people know how you feel and who you are. Right. So when your hair doesn't get to look the way you want, then you are not communicating to other people how you feel. Right. So there's a lot of suppression right that that term suppression suppress oppress suppress suppress i keep saying suppress suppress right to push down to quiet that pain that terror um the mental anguish right the physical pain it's it's just so reflective in every area like in the hospital in the healthcare system you know in our day-to-day -day lives in our love lives and our friendships um at our jobs like a black women do a lot of suppressing we do a lot of presenting to people and like, oh, I'm presenting as this way, but really I'm, I'm frustrated, I'm, I'm suffering, right? And in other cultures, they're able to express their own frustrations and suffering 
and be treated with care and kindness instead of the first thing someone doing is ridiculing you and telling you you're not enough, right? That's why community care is so important. I think that hair, like hair people, a barber, you talking a um, esthetician, right? Or a uh, hairstylist. I don't know why that word didn't come to me. But hairstylists are healers. They're healers. They literally have healing hands, right? When they're treating you with tenderness and care and kindness and they're supporting you and saying, you don't have to take this, you don't have to carry this load by yourself because you weren't meant to carry it by yourself. I got you, sis. Like, that changes people's lives. It changes their whole outlook. There's also a there's also an occurrence called black girl hair depression that I want that I want to touch on. You can go Google it, research it, but I'm gonna insert the clip um, here. Hair is done, so I don't want to kill myself anymore. It'd be like that. I hate hair depression. It's really a black woman thing, though. No, I'm not saying that like it is a black woman thing. As, like, I'll tell you why. Go ahead, cook. Because as black women, for so many years, we were sitting here thinking, damn. Need a perm, need a straighten. Everything got to be neat, put together and precise. I can't walk outside in a messy bun and just be like, okay, I know how society's going to look at me when my hair isn't done. So now I'm internalizing that and I'm looking at me like, oh yeah, you're a fucking bum ass piece of shit. Your hair not done. Okay, so you saw the clip, right? Um, and I also want to share this quote from Michaela Hampton. Um, she says, in many ways, my hair and how I feel about myself are linked, whether I want it to be or not, right? We don't get that privilege to say that it's not whether I want it to be or not. When I don't like my hair, it can truly take a toll on my, on my wanting to go out and be seen by others. If I do decide to go out still, there is, there is this overwhelming feeling that people are staring at me, even though that is likely not the case. But it makes me self-conscious about myself and limits my ability to just be in the moment, right? And so according to the 2023 Crown Workplace Research Study, over 20% of black women, 25 to 34, have been sent home from work because of their hair. So it's not in our head. My point is the fear, the shame, right? When we go out into the world, um, the, the fear that someone's going to judge us, it's not fake. It's not false. It's not something we have imagined. It's something that we experience, right? The first thing that we say to, oh, I love your hair, girl, or look at that girl's hair, right? Like we always do that. We always like all of our being is always being criticized in some way. Some part of our being is being criticized as black women in some way. We are always being told to fit in this box, to look like this thing, to be acceptable to me, to be loved, right? And so that creates anxiety with going out. I know that there have been times where I wanted to go out and I didn't because I'm like, okay, I got my outfit together, but what about my hair? What am I doing with my hair, right? And then if I can't figure out something with my hair, I'm not going. Or I'll just wrap it up again, right? And then people will say like, why are you wearing that head wrap? Because I don't feel like doing my hair. My hair is a mess under here. There was an instance where I was at work Oh, my goodness. And this woman, my manager, was like, so I had done this clay mask. It's a long story. I did this clay mask. It didn't turn out well. There was clay stuck in my hair. OK. And I had to go to work. So I said, well, I can't go to work with sandy hair like this hair looking like it's dirty because you're going to judge me. So I'm going to put on a head wrap. So I did that. I put on a head wrap. It was unassuming. It was a black head wrap. You know, didn't take up a lot of space just so I can go to work, make my coin and go home and figure out my hair later because I didn't have any time. My manager comes to me and says, oh, you know, you're not allowed to wear that on your head, right? What do you mean? Oh, well, unless you have a religious practice, you're not allowed to put a head wrap on your head. Honey, you don't need to know my religious practice, number one. Number two, it's not bothering any patients. I work in a hospital. They're fine. They're fine, right? But three, it really showed me, like, there really is no room for black women to have a bad day, to have a bad hair day. When I was at college... The girls, the white girls that I roomed with, they would wash their hair, put them in messy buns and walk out the door. Their hair would still be wet, right? They would be drying as they go along. They had room to not appear and show up as professional or put together, right? Black women don't have that room because y'all going to call her nappy headed. Y'all going to call her unkempt, right? What I love seeing is, is the girls with 4C. And again, I don't even know if I believe in all these different whatever. But the girls with thick, thick, thick hair being like my hair is finished. My hair is done. Right. And not giving you all any explanations because there's no explanation necessary. She said what she said. It's done. But I think that we think that we have the right to tell people how their hair should look, how it should appear, what is unkempt and what is what is not. Right. And usually it has to do with like a polished look somehow, like a slick down, pressing our hair, like being presentable. Who are we really trying to be presentable to? That's the question. Who are we trying to be presentable to? All that to say, I cut my hair in 2004 and it was the most freeing experience because I got to learn to love my short hair behind the scenes. I didn't have to show up 
in the world showing my hair because my hair was always braided. But when it wasn't, I was able to play with my hair in the mirror in the bathroom and be like, oh, I actually kind of I actually kind of like these curls. Right. And while I was learning to love my hair, it was being covered. I was being covered. I was being cared for. I didn't have to do that work of learning myself alone. I had hands to guide me. Right. I had people who had been there before. I had a community around me. I wasn't alone. And much like we talked about, like community coming together for the women in Ghana, for example. Right. And taking care of you. I was able to experience that care and my hair no longer for that moment felt like a burden. It felt like a gift. It felt like a time to come together with the girls and to gossip and to talk and to catch up and to be loved and be surrounded by other women who get it, by other women who are not judging me, right? By other women who are there literally just to support me. Like it was just such a beautiful experience and getting your hair done can feel that way by other people. It's like someone is taking their time, their precious time with you to take care of you so that you don't have to carry that burden, the burden of doing your hair and trying to be presentable to the world, you know, while trying to love, love yourself at the same time. Like what a heavy load that is for a 14 year old girl to carry. So I didn't have to do that work alone. So I got my hair braided for the first time, right? And she was kind and patient with me. She didn't tell me my hair was too coarse. She didn't feel frustration, right? Because this is what she did. Like this was like, I really feel like her, her she was such an instrumental being in my journey like I needed to meet her I needed to spend time with her um someone who was so patient and there and present with me so that I can learn how to love myself right so I felt safe with other black women and girls and she blessed me and nurtured my hair and my soul I am forever grateful for her I cut off what was stressing me out and it's so it's so interesting I was so hard pressed on having long straight hair but that was stressing me out that was a source of my frustration and my pain and when I cut it off I felt free I felt like I can breathe now. I, I can see myself now, you know? So I cut off what was stressing me out and began to live harmoniously with my dense coils and my thick hair. And I was praised for it, which I never was. I was praised for my thick hair, for my thick hair. Having someone to care for me and love me in ways I didn't even love myself was healing and life-changing. She helped me. I was overwhelmed and depressed and, you know, and beyond like pressing my hair for prom, I kept my hair in twists and in braids. And it was just amazing. Like, oh, wow, I don't have to fight my hair. I can just do my hair how it wants to be done anyway. The reason why my hair would twist is because my hair is already curly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, just put it, do, give the hair what it wants instead of fighting it and trying to force it to be something that it was never designed to be. It was never designed to be. And I had never thought about, like, maybe the way that I am is how God designed me to be. Maybe I'm already perfect. Maybe I'm already enough. Black women, period. When black women get together with one cause to love one another, they heal. They heal when black women get together, when their hands are. I've also had experiences of going to the hair shop and getting braids done. And these women would be having would be, you know, having conversations, eating and things like that. And be doing my hair three people at a time. Like they're gathered together for this one mission, right, to get this hair done. And even if it is done, you know, to make money, it still feels like care. It's still kindness, you know. So. Yes. So even though I was afraid of not having long hair and being pretty, right, I was also seeing myself and that hair and I still didn't feel pretty or enough, you know, so it was great just to cut it. So bless her. I'm always appreciative of her. At this point in college, I'm 18, freshly new, a freshman at Towson University, and my whole world shifted because now I'm on my own. I have no money. I only have time, right? And the resources I have, there's this new thing called YouTube. <laughs> there's this new thing called YouTube where I can look up other black women who are also doing their hair and their generosity changed my life forever. Welcome to chapter four. The natural hair care movement changed my life. So like I said, I went to college and I was on my own pretty much. Girl, God bless. My hair had grown since then. Um, I was feeling my natural hair. It was more... Uh, acceptable to have natural hair now in 2008 and I went to college and I was at a PWI which means a predominantly white institution and you had to find your black friends right but my black friends didn't really do hair <laughs> so I was kind of on my own and so I went to Target and Walmart and I was buying all these products spending money I didn't have for my little refund check at college trying to figure out what products work for me then I found YouTube. God bless YouTube. There are black women on there very early on teaching other black women what works for their hair, what they've tried. And it just became a source, like a resource for black women. 
Um, and I was so grateful to them because I was able to try, you know, hairstyles and products and not have to waste my time or my energy or my effort or my money because I was actually be, being able to see in real time, right? It's not the just for me perms anymore. It's in real time I can see what happens when you use this product on this kind of hair. And then you can kind of guess for yourself, right? And everything's a guessing game until you actually try it yourself. But I was still, again, so appreciative. Um, so navigating, learning how to care for my hair was rough. Like I said, I was on my own. I don't know what I was doing. I had people caring for my hair and I was watching what they did, but I didn't really know what they were doing, right? To this day, I still need to learn how to cornrow. Don't come for me, <laughs> but I need, to, I need to learn how to cornrow. But I could do the braids, I could do the twists, right? I could do basic things to get along. I could do the puff. I could do, you know, even like the um, textured, like, what is it called? Defining your curls, like I could do that. Um, there was a product, I forget the name, it doesn't matter. But I could learn how to do those things, right? But I wanted to still do like protective styles. And that was what was stressing me out. So I was twisting my hair constantly, right? Um, and I was watching other videos from other black women. And then I stumbled upon... Um, I stumbled upon locks, locks. And this was in the year 2010, I locked my hair officially. But I was looking at videos. I'm like, huh, how do I want to start locks? And I lived an active lifestyle. I would swim. I would play volleyball. I was out here doing things, right? I didn't have time to keep doing my hair every day. I can't do that, right? And refreshing and doing it again. I have class. I got 8 a.m. class, <laughs> you know? So I was toying with the idea of locks. And, um, and I looked at... I looked at this one video about braid locks and I had never heard of it before. I was like, braid locks, huh? Let me, cause all I knew was with locks, you have to start with coils, comb coils or two strand twists. That wasn't going to work for me. My hair was going to unravel. My hair was going to do what it does. Right. So braid locks, I was like, wow. So I don't even have to comb my hair. <laughs> I don't have to comb my hair. Maybe the next step to, to twisting is locking. And that's exactly what I did. I started my locks in 2010 I mean, I had them in for four years and it was an amazing experience. It, I loved it because I didn't have to comb my hair. I hate combing my hair. I hate combing my hair. And I mean that. I hate, hate. It don't matter about the product. I hate combing my hair. Um, it hurts <laughs> and it's frustrating and I have a lot of hair. And so this was an amazing opportunity for me to lean into, instead of fighting, leaning into how my hair grow out of my hair naturally, Right. So, um, so I was watching videos about natural hair care, you know, and black women had all the time types of textures. And so seeing a woman starting her hair with locks because she had the same problems as me was so freeing. And that's exactly what I did. I went to one of my friends. I was online at the time. Um, and that's another thing. I was online. So just imagine this natural hair. I was online. I was pledging. I was, um, studying six. I was full, full load, six classes. I had two jobs. I had no time. And so my line sister, bless her, she helped me start my braid locks. And um, that was the journey. That was the start of the journey for me. And I edited and made them a little smaller. And eventually they started locking for real. And I was like, oh, my gosh, we're doing this. We're doing it. So I no longer had to really look at the natural hair care community. Um, but I did notice, I did notice um, that the natural hair care community started to change. At some point, it went from the 4C girls, helping the 4C girls out, it became more profitable to be a girl with curly hair. And no offense to my curly hair girls out there. I see y'all. I love y'all. But we started getting erased. They were now the, the example of natural hair. They were, they were the example of how you wanted your natural hair to come out, right? The loose curls. And I realized that a lot of like black women were struggling with this because they're like, my hair doesn't do that naturally, right? My hair is not that loose. My hair is actually very, very tight. Or people who had zigzag patterns, right? Where were they fitting into this? And because YouTube was turning into a place now where ads were run and it was about the money and about the, um, de um, what do you call it, brand deals, right? And all these different things, it became about the money and the products as opposed to what it was before as community care and like a, a source a, a source of knowledge for black women to share, to share resources. And a lot of thicker hair, curlier hair girls got pushed out. And colorism, featureism, texturism was back. The thing that we gathered to fight, right? The thing that we, not even to fight, to say that we're fighting outside, right? The white folks. We weren't even thinking about the white gaze. That's the thing. It was just black women sharing resources with one another, right? But they started getting pushed to the side because they were no longer seen as desirable. They were no longer fitting the aesthetic that was trendy, which was the loose, 
you know, big hair girls, right? And so at the time, again, I'm, I'm locked, so I'm not really thinking about this, but I was thinking about women who were frustrated with their own hair because it wasn't turning out the way that, that the girls on the tutorial said it should turn out. I'm grateful for it, right? Because the natural hair care movement taught me to work with my hair instead of against it, right? That my hair is not wrong, but the force and pressure I put on it to be anything other than what it was created to be And the way that it grows out of my head, that is wrong. The pressure is wrong. The judgment is wrong. I am not wrong, right? And black women need time and care, right? And that's okay. And that's sacred. People have wash days. Sometimes I don't have the energy for all that, but shout out to y'all. Like, that's their self-care day. And I remember even when I had my own wash days with my locks, right? Because that's a lot of work, too. Having to retwist every, you know, couple of months or so, right? Um, I would spend the whole day watching movies, listening to music, eating snacks, Take a break. Do it again tomorrow. Right. These were set times sacred, even though I was working and I was, you know, my arms were tired and my hands were numb and they were hurting and things like that. It was still time set aside. Like I'm not doing anything from this day to this day. I'm taking care of myself. It taught me, it almost forced me to take Sabbath. Right. Even though it was still work, I was still caring for myself. I was giving that love and that care and that attention to, the, to myself as I needed it. Um, and so I was able to focus on myself and what I needed for a few days. I gave myself face masks, you know, soaked in the bath, took my time, watched movies I wanted to watch. I had a whole like a lot of discs. Um, shout out to discs, uh, DVDs. And it was great. I was able to set aside time to take care of myself. And so black women may need more time and attention and care. And that makes sense, actually, because of all the things that we have suffered in this country and in this this global experience, to be quite honest, like black women need a lot of care and attention. And if you can't afford to go to the hair salon and be cared for, you got to do it yourself. And so that takes time and attention. So like I said, my hair was not the problem, but I didn't have the capacity to do what the girls were doing. The wash days, the combing, the blow drying, just to do it again next week. I could not. So I locked my hair. And I didn't have to touch my hair or do it for like six weeks, six weeks at a time, sometimes maybe even longer, maybe eight weeks. And then I would, you know, besides like washing it in between, I would retwist it. Other than that, I would wash it, let it air dry and keep on going. And it was the best. It was the best experience of my life. So like I said, I'm in college at this point and... I'm having a great time, dyeing my hair, styling it, doing new things. My hair is growing. I'm having a great time. And like I said, I noticed that the natural hair care community online is changing. Representation was really important. Um, Being able to see women like you with hair like you, you know, showing you how to do the thing, showing you to be kind with yourself, to take time with yourself, showing you what products to work would work with your hair and which would not what products would not um, was a game changer for all of us, for a lot of us. But like I said, at some point, I, I noticed I noticed a shift. I said it went from black women with thick, coarse hair to mixed girls with curly hair. Right. And again, all love to my mixed girls with curly hair. But this felt this felt ah, this felt intentional and not from the girls with curly hair, but from product placement and ad revenue and all the powers that be, right? Um, it shifted from a grassroots kind of community effort to help one another to to more of a business and for profit movement, right? So the content that was being pushed um, was to platform other women who were being seen as women with the accepted blackness, the acceptable black features. Like your hair's not too curly, you know, you're not too light, you're not too dark skin, excuse, excuse me. Um, you know, you look a certain way, right? And so um, the content was confusing because it went from the girls who get it like me to other girls who were being praised for having hair like this. And what it also did was it it kind of skewed people's understanding of what black hair is supposed to look like using supposed to loosely here, but how black hair looks right. Black hair looks a million different ways. But what was platformed were the curly curly girls hair. Like their hair was praised like, oh, that's so beautiful. That's so pretty. It's so soft. It's so nice. And we're looking like, what about us? (laughs) You know what I mean? What about us? Do we have to get our hair done like this? And the answer, it seemed, was yes. Because I did not see a lot of girls like me with hair like me who were allowing their froze just to be free, right? And not trying to over manipulate their hair or define their curls even. Like, why do I have to define my curls? Why can't they just be? Why can't I have any natural hairstyles that are just natural? It's like, no, it's just all this to do just to look presentable again to other people, right? 
and the thicker hair girls like me were being pushed to the side, even though they were the laborers who built that platform. They were the ones who started that movement. And black women often knows how that feels to have start a movement, to put all your blood and your sweat and your tears into something just for it to be co-opted by somebody else. They use black women for their labor often. And that was no different in the hair care community, in my opinion. Um, Yes. So they laid the groundwork. They did the work and it was co-opted by other people. It started again. It was happening again. Right. Black women were, were finally centering themselves, then being sold colorism and texturism all over again by these companies, by these companies. Um, this community was built on the backs and the labor of black women with coarse hair, dark skinned black women. And it was co-opted by other people who are now reaping the benefits because they saw black women coming together in community and saw it as an opportunity to make money. And so they want to make money with the people that they respect and the people that they can understand. So they're doing it with people who are right on that line of like, yeah, it's different than us, but not too different. It doesn't make us feel too insecure. And I also noticed products changing. I remember back in the day, there was a commercial by Shea Moisture um, where they were talking about like bad hair care, care days or something like that. And it was two white women and it, it was a lighter skin, curlier hair girl. And there was no representation for us. Meanwhile, Shea Moisture was like our thing. It was like, oh, this is for us. The products are thick enough. Like it's enough to lather and things like that and to like work the hair. They started changing the formula to appeal to more to a more white audience. That also happened with the Miel, um, M-I-E-L-L-E, I believe it's spelled i don't know how to pronounce it but miel the hair oil that was a whole thing the black girls finally found a hair oil that worked for them and the fear was that oh no the white girls are getting to it so now they're going to change it for us because they're make they're giving them more money as if white women don't already have enough products on their shelves suave um the ones that i used to love with herbal essence i used to want <laughs> poor me i used to use herbal essence thinking my hair was going to turn out like the women in the commercials and didn't understand, girl, that's product, that's styling, right? And that's also not your hair. Um, but I, but it would wear my hair out. It'd be so, it'd be so stripped of oil or anything. And it was just unhealthy. And I'm like, dang, y'all don't have enough. Y'all got to colonize everything. And they did. And because Shea Moisture, I, I think, was sold to another company, they started changing their formula. And to this day, to this day, I still, the, the products that I used to use, they're never the same. It's never been the same. And I bought it again, maybe like a few weeks before I cut my hair this last time and it didn't work. I said, you know what? Forget it. Cut it. Cut it. But either way, black women were being forgotten again. Black women's efforts and their labor and their care and their kindness were being forgotten about again. They saw black women as an opportunity to make money, to sell us insecurity, to sell us shame, to sell us colorism and featurism and texturism. And it worked. We bought their products trying to achieve what they were selling right um so that was very frustrating um and black women were upset rightfully so because how many times is it going to happen how many times are black women going to uphold and and help pour into a company that's just going to betray us in the end they see us as workhorses and nothing else they see us as a as a way to make money and nothing else it was very disappointing actually black women often feel used and forgotten and many black women left because they and their work were being um co-opted right and buried underneath of the algorithm and not getting any brand dealers like brand deals and things like that. Like they were being left out and they couldn't sustain and they had to turn, they had to pivot into something else. There were a bunch of hair care people doing their things who left because it was no longer profitable or sustainable for them. And I still thank them and bless them because they still helped me and I'm still grateful for them to this day. OK, finding out about a Denman brush. I never knew what that was, what the lock method. Um, so many things like like how to properly detangle and how to make it easier for you in the shower. Like I'm so appreciative of these women and I don't blame them for leaving. I understand it's frustrating and heartbreaking when you start something, when you build something and people either destroy it over and over and over again, or they're telling you that it's not enough or they're giving the platform to other people who did not labor like you did. It's not fair. It's not fair. Um, so they left. <laughs> so they left. And so even again, the formulas and the stores change, right? And again, it also influenced other people to expect all black women's hair to be curly in a palatable way, in a palatable way. So shout out again to the women who are like, this is my 4C hair or thick hair or whatever you want to call it, coarse hair, curly hair, coily hair, right? And it's done. 
I'm not defining any curls for you. I'm not detangling for you. I'm walking out the house. And I love that because it really shows that people really don't love natural hair. <laughs> you know what I mean? It really shows that people don't really love natural hair because you don't know what natural hair really is. And I don't mean natural as in, I mean natural as in like doing the least possible, right? What is equity, right? What When we're talking about like hair equity and things like this, like opportunities being taken because you don't think that their hair is, is uh, kept up, right? White women, again, are able to leave their house with messy buns while their hair is still wet. Meanwhile, my hair is moisturized, clean, and everything, and I can't walk out the door with a fro because it intimidates you. Why is that? Something is off. Even though the, the movement was to help black women to feel seen and heard and appreciated and valued and helped, because it was co-opted, it ended up doing the opposite. It buried women even more. It, it caused us to want to labor even more to make our hair even more presentable and acceptable by other people. Right. And again, we know what that feels like as black women in general, in general. We do all this work just to have it co-opted or to say like, oh, well, that's not enough. It has to show up like this. Right. To have white people coming in while our things are working for us and say like, you know what? I think you should do this. We didn't ask you. We don't care. <laughs> we don't care. <laughs> OK. Um, so when people say they like a fro or a natural hair, they meant at that time a curly fro. They meant a more relaxed hairstyle. Right. They didn't really mean this. I'm going to insert a picture here of a fro. They didn't mean this. They meant this, right? And so you're measuring yourself up against it, and it's really frustrating. So black women created a safe space for us, as we do, as black women do, right? But money, business, and texturism, colorism, all the isms, funds, things in this country, sadly, because it's, it's ghetto here. And so we had to sell texturism and color. We had to sell you not enoughness so that you bought stuff to feel enough. So while you all are bl while you black women are loving your hair, that's great. But I'm going to slip in some colorism and texturism a little bit right here so that the beauty that you're trying to uh, reach is unattainable for you. And you're always going to buy my products over and over again, hoping that this will be the product. This $15 here, this 18. And that's another thing. This hair care stuff product is these these products for black women's hair is not cheap. It's not cheap. We are taxed because we have thicker hair. You can buy Swaffer for, for like a dollar, right? Baseline black girl shampoo, at least 10. At least. And then you need enough. It's, this is not going to cut it. I got thick hair. My, my hair drinks up product, okay? So you got to get a whole jar, right, and then some. Like, it's, it's actually ridiculous. So I know that we talked about black girl hair depression earlier a little bit, but I want to go a little deeper and share what I wrote down in my journal about this. So I said, black women are constantly under intense criticism and hypervigilance for their hair, really their whole being, but especially their hair, right? Because that's where we start. We just start with the hair and we just go down. We start criticizing everything else, the tone of their skin, right? The color of their eyes, the size of their nose, their lips, like all these different things that are commodified right now. Um, black women are... are hyper criticized for and our hair can be a direct place of judgment to experience texturism and all these other isms right that, ha that have us bound so we wonder like why we don't think we're beautiful who are they using as models even when we're talking about the youtube natural hair care debacle right who are we seeing as as platform people it's not people who look like me with my texture but for some of these other women they were seen as the acceptable black you know what I mean? They're black, but just enough that it doesn't make us uncomfortable. Their hair is curly and big, but not enough that it makes us uncomfortable. If our hair doesn't look like how they say it should look like, other people may deem us as unkempt, right? Ugly, ghetto, unprofessional, unclean, etc. Literally, literally, um, classism is just thrown in there. If, if a girl's hair is not done, you assume that it's because she doesn't have any money or any respect about her. Respectability rears its head again. But you, you assume these things because it's not done. When it could be a whole reason. Maybe she loves the way her hair looks, number one, right? But number two, maybe she doesn't have the care. She doesn't have the knowledge, money, resources, time, energy, effort. People are just trying to survive. <laughs> they don't need your judgment. They didn't ask you, actually, right? So check, check yourself. Um, as, as white classmates went to class in college, they were able to show up messy and unkempt and not be judged for it. Literally in jammies, okay, pajamas, like literally showing up in pajamas. And they were not worried about it. But I saw the effort and the energy that black women put into appearing good enough, right? Because if I look good enough, you can't discount me on that. You can't disqualify me on that, right? Now you have to listen to me. Now you have to understand me. Now you have to take me seriously. These kinds of things. 
We know what that feels like. Um, there were many times that I would that I would find myself curled up in a ball crying because I could not detangle my hair because it wasn't turning out right. Right. Because I spent X amount of dollars, twenty dollars probably in college of my money and this product doesn't work. And so that's the thing. These these products, these companies were selling us an outcome that was not realistic for my hair type. But I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that because you say this is what your product does. So I'm expecting it to do that. I'm expecting it to do what you said it should do. I was broke. OK, I was broke. I was exhausted. I was depleted. I was depressed. Um, like I wasn't being cared for and I wasn't taking care of myself. And that was like those hair instances, those hair moments would be the straw that broke the camel's back. I would just lose it. There were times when people were not gentle and kind to me or my hair. When I got married, I went to this lady who said that she was a natural hair care professional. And I, I trusted her and I went to her. She was combing my hair from the root to the tip. Now, if you have curly or coily hair, you know good and well. You start at the tip and you work your way up. She was so impatient with me and she was fitting me in between her own busy schedule that like she, however she did my hair, she was combing it, but my scalp was so sore afterwards. This is the, and this is before my wedding where I'm supposed to be cared for and like loved on. And my wedding was traumatic anyway. That's a different story for a different day. We'll get back to that. But the wedding leading up to it, it was just not kind. It was not careful. It was not gentle in any sort of way. And then she left me by myself and I had to ask my aunt who came from Florida to help finish my hair. It was a whole thing. It was it was a debacle. But either way, the whole thing taught me like, dang, even in me getting married, I'm still uncared for. Even in me getting married, like you don't even want to take time with me. Those instances where women had their hands in my hair without care traumatized me. It traumatized me. What was praised back then was slick, like the baby hairs, laying the baby hairs down and, and getting them in perfect, you know, perfect puffs and things like that. There was no room like the, it seemed like the goal for a lot of content online, especially for the curly haired girls, was to one, play up curls that are defined, but then also to slick the hair down in ways that my hair just did not slick. My hair is not slicking. If it's slick at the top under here, it's a mess. OK, the rest of the hair is a mess. You know what I mean? And, and getting it to look like that was so stressful. And I wrote down, I said, it's hard to slick my hair into a bun. And that's often how it can feel to exist as a black woman. You're too big. You're too loud. You're too bright. You're inconvenient. You're inconvenient. Um, you're snatching and forcing your hair into containers. You're snatching and forcing yourself into containers to fit, to be seen as enough, to be seen as lovable, kind, respectable, like to be treated kindly, right? You're doing all this work to over manipulate yourself into fitting into what other people deem as respectable and beautiful, right? And what are the ramifications of that, right? You're stressed out, you're tired, you're depressed, you're depleted, you know, you're worn down. Even people experiencing alopecia, people joke about that and it's not funny, but like people joke about alopecia, it's, it's not a joke. Like people are losing their edges because of having to force their hair in, in ways that aren't natural or over manipulating themselves or like people are suffering. People are suffering trying to be seen as beautiful enough. Right. And I'm not talking about like alopecia. That's not like tension related. I'm talking about specifically tension related alopecia. So in braiding your hair too tightly, putting your hair in a ponytail too often, um, you know, wearing too like wearing wigs and, and having to. There's so many reasons why women experience alopecia and it's such a, pr a precious thing that people make a joke like alopecia is a sign of stress. It's a sign of tension, of pulling too tightly. And I, I'm just amazed at how like the hair is a reflection of the soul and how having to over manipulate and overperform and do too much and be the best. Right. Exhausts us. And the tension at some point like rips us apart. It terrorizes us. It traumatizes us. We walk through the world holding our breath, bracing for impact. When we come home, that's when we can finally breathe. We take the bra off, the wig off, everything. And we can finally be ourselves for like two hours before we go to sleep and then have to do it all over again. That'll wear on your soul. That will deplete you. The policing, the code switching, tone policing, right? Like body policing, like the hypervigilance, like the, the being hyper aware of you always being judged all the time for any little thing. Like there's no room for error as a black woman in America in the West. You know, if you make the wrong decision, there's no grace for you. <laughs> the wrong decision. If you make a mistake, if you're human, there's no room for black women to be human in the West. In this understanding of what is respectable and what is enough. You know, 
Traction alopecia, right? Pulling the hair too tight and ripping the hair out of the scalp. After a while, it gets too much. It gets too much. When you're not well, sometimes your hair can go undone. Can go undone. So not only do you feel bad because the world is awful, (laughs) it's hard. You also feel bad because you can't even get yourself together because we're praised as black women for keeping it together no matter what we're going through, right? And so then now you feel shame because you can't get it together like everybody else is getting it together. You know what I mean? Your hair, your hair is a sign of your mental health in a way sometimes. And like, or your social status or your financial status. Um, And so now you're going out into the world being ridiculed You don't need to be ridiculed for how you look on top of struggling with the weight of the world. It's exhausting. It's too much work, right? Um, And so again, I go back to that Ghana quote. I think that's so beautiful how people took care of themselves. But one thing that protective styles taught me, right? It protects the hair from over manipulation. It keeps the hair in one place. It keeps your hands out of your hair, right? It, it, It lifts the burden a little bit, right? And what is that likened to? That is likened to like women taking care of you, like you being cared for in community, you covering yourself, you staying home when you need to, you taking a break when you need to, you having a Sabbath, not having to face the world all the time and compete all the time and to prove your worth and your value to people every day. That's exhausting. You need a break. You need a protective style. So I had locks. I love them. They were great. I think they were beautiful. And people were telling me that my locks were beautiful. But this started to bother me. It started to bother me that, oh, my God, your hair is so pretty. That's the first thing they would say to me. Your hair is so pretty. And it felt like my hair started to become a burden and a prison. Like I locked my hair because I didn't want to fuss with it and I wanted to be free. Right. But now it seemed like, oh, this is another way for people to judge me. I just didn't like it. I didn't like it. I, 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 I appreciated the compliments, but I didn't like that it felt like I was still performing, that my locks still have to look nice because that is the compliment that I'm going to get, right? That's how I'm going to be seen. So for four years, I grew out my hair, right? I loved it. It was great. I really enjoyed locking my hair. It was fun. Um, but after a while, I was burdened with the upkeep. So locks are nice until you have to relock them or retwist them if you choose to. And some people don't. And I think the next time I get locks, I might do a semi-free form. We'll see, because I don't feel like doing all that. Like, what is he, what is, like, experimenting with allowing my hair just to grow as it grows, right? But I was twisting it. I was interlocking it. So that's taking a tool and going in every lock and pulling it through. Like, you're kind of sewing your hair. Like, you're sewing it closed. Um, That was a lot of work. It was a lot of time. It was a lot of energy and effort. And it was starting to become fatiguing. Like, those days that I set aside to wash my hair and do my hair, where it's, like, self-care days, became, became, more of an inconvenience, um, especially when I started to work, right, work full time. And I was like, this is not going to work. It's not going to work. Um, and I don't I didn't want to have this negative energy around my head. I didn't want to have this feeling that I had as a child, like my hair is in a way it's in, it's in the way it's an inconvenience. It needs to be fixed. I wanted to have love around my head. And it was kind of fading because I was getting tired of doing it. I was getting tired of doing it and I didn't have money to get it done. So I thought about cutting it all off. <laughs> well, one, I thought about combing it out. I had a couple of friends who combed out their locks, but I had interlocked my hair. So combing it out would have been a lot of work and I didn't want to do all that. So then I thought about cutting my hair off and I toyed with that idea for months. I was like, I think I could cut my hair. Every time I twisted my hair, I was like, dang, I should just cut it. And I just kept twisting it because I felt like this is what's making me pretty. I was back there again. My hair is making me pretty. People compliment my hair. What are they going to say? What if I look like a boy? What if I'm not pretty anymore? What if I don't get any compliments anymore? And I decided to test that theory. (laughs) One day, I went to the hair salon and I said, I would like you to cut off my locks. And of course, at first she was like, why? And I was like, I just need to get it done. I need to cut off my locks. Um, And that was a kind of rough (laughs) experience. She was not kind or she was quick. She was trying to hurry up and get me on her chair. Um, But I needed time. to. Halfway through, I said, can you stop for a second? She's like, why? You know, it's already done now. I was like, just give me a second to breathe. This is four years of locked hair. This is four years of experience, right? My hair has been my friend for four years. And I'm saying goodbye to a friend. Um, Yeah, like when I had my locks, it felt like in a way I was still being judged in a good way, right, for my hair. And it bothered me. It bothered me. Um, I wanted my hair to be my own. But at some point, it started to feel like everybody else's. Like everybody else had a say in what I did to my hair or how I presented myself or how it would show up. And I didn't feel all the way free. And I was like, something has to change. Um, yeah. I thought I wanted to be seen for my hair. Like, as a kid, how I wanted to be seen as beautiful for my hair, right? But I wanted to just be seen as me. I just wanted to be seen. 
and loved. And I still wasn't happy. The locks weren't the fix. Um, so I cut my hair. <laughs> so I cut off the hair. So she, she finally finished the haircut and I felt bald and naked. And I went outside and I remember like trying to hide myself. Like people know what I look like, right? Like random strangers know what I look like, like before. I'm anybody at this point. But I remember walking out and being so timid and afraid of being seen. I was like, oh my God, people can see my short hair. Oh no, like what do I look like? And my hair was not even as short as it is now, <laughs> but it was really, really, really short. I didn't think that I, that I looked beautiful. And it wasn't until I went home and took some pictures and selfies, because that's what I did. Um, I took some selfies and looked at the photos like, actually, girl, you're kind of cute. Actually, I love it. Actually, this is you. It's, it's suiting, right? So I started sending the pictures to my friends and kept on pushing. And I started stepping into this confidence that I didn't have before. I was so proud of myself for doing something so scary and unconventional. I was so proud of myself for being brave and cutting it all off and saying, screw what you think about me and my hair. I'm going to do what I want. And I think cutting off my hair made me more confident. It made me feel sexy. It made me feel beautiful. Like I feel, even now, I feel my most beautiful when my hair is shut, short. I feel beautiful. Um, I feel free. I feel like I am my own. I feel like I can see my face. I feel like there's no curtains hanging over me anymore like this is all of me and all of me is beautiful. Um, it was just like such a healing experience to cut off my hair. Scary at first. And people of course had something to say because again, my hair doesn't just belong to me. That's not how it was treated. My hair also belongs to my mother, my aunt, um, other women, friends in my community who did my hair, right? People put in time and energy and effort into it. And I, I think in a way it's like, you don't, wanna, you don't wanna have your hair like the way that we used to do it. You know, but I'm grateful for those experiences. It's not that I cut off those experiences because those experiences are still with me. It's just that I need to reclaim myself. And cutting off my hair was a reclamation of myself, a reclamation of beauty, uh, redefining it in a way that I saw fit. And I love that because now I can experiment with other things, makeup if I want to, or, you know, outfits, earrings. Maybe I'm not even concerned with my appearance as much, right? Like maybe I can just show up now without thinking about like how I'm going to wear my hair. I could just show up and be. I could just be myself. I'm free now. <laughs> I'm free. Before I cut my hair, people were trying to talk me out of it. And I felt guilty. I felt really, really guilty. Like I was letting other people down. I didn't like that feeling. I hate that feeling even still. Like, oh, no, did I make the right decision? Even though it's a decision that I want to make, if other people are disappointed or don't agree with it, then I still feel it's a people pleaser in me. I'm trying to heal it. Um, but yes, but I always feel bad. Um, even now, my family jokingly uh, criticizes my short hair or makes jokes. When are you going to grow it out? You need to stop cutting your hair. You know, things like that. And they don't mean anything by it, but it does get to me sometimes. But I wanted to feel like I belong to myself, you know. I was also afraid of being seen as masculine, that word. Mas you're a masculine woman because we, we associate femininity, femininity with long hair, with long straight hair, flowy hair, right? And so what does that mean if I cut off my hair? Does it mean that I'm not, no longer feminine? Does it mean that I'm no longer woman? Does it mean that I will no longer be respected? All these fears were coming up because they're very valid. You are treated differently when you're seen as a masculine woman. You are treated differently when you're not seen as feminine, right? Being seen as feminine offers protection in patriarchy, right? You're seen as someone to protect, not because they care about you, but because, you know, oh, you're some dainty thing that I need to protect and, and hold sacred and dear, right? And so by cutting off my hair, I was recognizing that I was also cutting off that connection to, that connection to uh, patriarchy and protection in that way. And I was like, am I really ready for it? Am I really ready to face the world as a grown woman who can do whatever she wants, <laughs> you know, like, was I really prepared for that? Yeah, and I was learning to see myself, to embrace myself as I am, short hair and all, right? And the thing is, I was born with short hair. I was born bald, okay? I had wispy wisps, like, my mom had little struggle bows <laughs> on my pictures, but I was born bald. I was, I was born into this world as bald, and I was still seen as beautiful then. What changed? Why does it matter that I'm older now? What changed? I was bald then, I'm bald now, so now what? right? I'm still lovely. I'm still beautiful. I'm still all the things that my parents thought I was and everybody thought I was when I was new to this world, like freshly out the womb, right? What changed? Nothing. Just society's expectations of what womanhood is and what, how black women should show up, you know, and how femininity should look and all these different things. I bloomed. <laughs> I bloomed when I cut my hair. It was almost like a pruning process. I cut off what was weighing me down and what was stressing me out 
And I bloomed. I had room to do all the things I wanted to do. I had room to be the person I wanted to be, to create the things I want to be, to show up authentically and as myself without worrying about how I'm going to be consumed by other people because I'm not a product to be consumed. I am my own. And that, again, was a reclamation of myself. Um, I lived unafraid and not always concerned with how I present to other people, not trying to be digestible to other people. I felt the sun on my face. I felt the sun on my scalp and the cold air, okay? Because when you cut your hair in the winter, you're cold. You're cold. <laughs> I was free. So much free time, detached from my hair and therefore treating myself well and kindly with love. I had the energy and the time to dress myself as I like. I played with makeup. I taught myself that my beauty was not directly tied to my hair. Shout out to India Ari. Let's go on to the next chapter. So since I cut my hair off, I have grown my hair out. I have locked it twice. I have cut it off again. I have dyed it. I have straightened it. Um, and I keep coming back to short hair for some reason. It's just like a rebirth. It's like, let's start from ground zero again. Um, but since then, I've done a lot. I've done a lot to my hair. And I went through the ugly stages, even like that thought, the ugly stage. What did that even mean? Ugly stage of hair growth, especially when you're locking it, is short hair. Right. So now we're being taught that having short hair is ugly, just like all this programming. Right. But going through the ugly phase and I'm re I want to rename that going through the phase of hair growth. Your hair is just growing and at every length it's beautiful. And I love going through that process over and over again because it shows me like you are not any of these things. You're not any of these things. Whether my hair is short, whether it is long or locked or curled or straightened in a fro like I am my own. I am free. Um, and, I, and I love that. I love that I have played with my hair so much and cut it off so much and defied what other people told me to do because they said like, oh, this is beauty, right? Or even when I feel the pressure of wanting to be beautiful again, sometimes I cut my hair off again to be like, Alicia, this is who you are. This is who you are. And even at this stage, even with hair this short, you're still beautiful. You're still enough. You're still worthy. You think of it in the back of your head, right? Like going through the ugly stages and things like that and you wrap your head, like little things like this. When I was growing my hair out this last time, I was very, even though I wrapped my head sometimes because I didn't feel like doing it, I wanted to embrace the ugly stage. I wanted to embrace the short hair with no curls, no define nothing, just allowing my hair to grow out of my head as an act of self-love and self-care to remind myself like this is who you are and this is beautiful even if it's not shiny and pretty in their eyes or if it's not um coily or defined like your hair is beautiful you're you are beautiful you are altogether beautiful you are altogether lovely right um so that has been a journey when we were rving me and my husband i have this story i want to tell y'all we were rving and our rv broke down like the tires popped i think or something and i recorded a video and my hair was not done it just wasn't retwisted or anything. And we were in the middle of an emergency. So I posted the video later in a vlog when we were traveling the States in our RV. And I had a commenter on the video say to me, oh, you should, you should get yourself together before you come on camera. I can see the beady beads in the back of your head. So not even in crisis am I allowed, <laughs> am I allowed the right to have my hair exist as it is? And so what if it had beady beads? Hello, I love my beady beads. I love these girls. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was just amazing to me, though. Like, really reflecting on it. it. It irritated me a little bit, but then I'm like, she's not free. That woman commenting that is not free. If you're criticizing me for how my hair is growing out of my head before I get on a camera where we are in crisis, by the way. We're stranded in the middle of nowhere with pop tires on an RV with no way to change the tire. Like, and, and that is your focus? That's what you're concerned about? My hair? It just shows you how always like black women are always criticized. It's never enough. Even in a time of crisis, people are deeming you unworthy. Like what? What are we doing? Anywho, there have been a lot of examples of, like that. People making unnecessary comments or I have cousins back at home who will say things about my hair, like even jokingly and in jest, you know, but it does have tones of texturism. <laughs> it does have tones of colorism, you know, and featureism and all these things. Um, and what I've learned is, is that if I'm going to be free, it's going to cost me. It's going to cost me. Um, it taught me that my hair was never difficult, right? It's just that the culture doesn't like my hair. Um, I deserve kindness and care. 
And when people see you as unkempt, like the person who made the comment on my video, right? It really shows you how people process who is deserving of love and care. Like she really thought that I had to get myself together to be cared for in this video, to, to, be, to be shown concern and empathy. Like somehow my hair was a prerequisite for her care and her understanding and her empathy, right? And it just it's just a microcosm of what black women experience on a global scale, right? Black women are often seen, seen as not worthy enough to care about, not worthy enough for kindness, right? Um, and you being free is a problem to a lot of people. You not caring about what people think about how you look will bother a lot of people because they feel entitled to you. They feel entitled to your worry and your concern. They see themselves as more important. Their opinion is more important than your own freedom. That's what it taught me. I learned a lot through this hair, th through this hair journey, um, especially now as I'm getting older and cutting my hair and, you know, redefining what beauty looks like for myself, which is just not based in and that's okay. It's not based in these white supremacist lies of what beauty is. It never was. And I think that's why I never felt comfortable with it. Like, it never felt good to me because I don't find that beautiful. I think everybody is beautiful. And people will say, like, oh, well, everybody's not. I think everybody's beautiful. I, like, I say that. I say it. And I mean that, <laughs> you know? Beauty is not what we think it is. We have been brainwashed to think that beauty looks one way. And it doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, it, cutting my hair, like, helped me to see myself, see my whole skin, all of my skin. When I was in high school, I had acne bad. I grow chin hairs, right? Like, it, it really forces me to love myself. Even if I choose not to love myself, it forces me to confront myself, to confront what I've been running from, hiding behind my hair and all these other things, right? Um, just shedding all that stuff that doesn't mean, actually mean anything to me. It doesn't mean much to me, you know? The fact that the Crown Act had to be created in the first place says it all. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. It says it all. We're literally like trying to exist, right? Our very being is seen as unprofessional. Just our existence is seen as unprofessional. And we're and what does that mean, right? It means that we're seen as below standard. This is like literal definitions. Below standard, improper, unethical, <laughs> unprincipled, unbecoming, negligent, unworthy. And unworthy of what you might ask? Unworthy of respect, love, care. Like we hear people, when we see people go out with bonnets, people will say stuff like, oh, they don't respect themselves. And what that really communicates to me is that you don't want to respect them. You don't want to respect them. And it's actually not about them respecting themselves because they do respect themselves, right? Like what is your definition of respect? Is it about looking and appearing a certain way to people or is it about like love? And what if self-respect and love is like, I'm going to show up in this world and not care about how y'all think about me because I'm that free. Wouldn't that be radical, right? But instead we're saying, oh, they don't respect themselves because we're looking for people to feel elevated above. That's the problem. It's not them wearing the bonnet. They're not bothering you. Or you think like, oh, one black person represents all of us to white people. Why we care about white, what white people think about us is beyond me, right? I understand why we think about them in the workplace <laughs> and all these other places. But I'm at the grocery store, honey. Why are you in my head? Because we think that we are allowed to tell black women how they can show up in spaces. We're, we think that we have the audacity and the authority to rule over black women, to control black women, because we've been taught that, that, that we are here to be controlled and consumed. So much so that we're, we're, made, we're made to feel uncomfortable with somebody taking up space as they want to take up space with a bonnet on in the grocery store. That's wild to me, right? And so unworthy of respect, love, care even in the way that people deal with their hair. You're, you have nappy hair, so you're, you're gonna get this rough, this rough love because I need to brush this hair. No, why can't you take your time and gently pull the hair into the thing, right? It might need a little more, you know, force because our hair has a little bounce back, you know what I'm saying? It's not just about to go anywhere, <laughs> you know what I mean? But just like black women, we're not finna go anywhere. Where are we going and why? Mm-mm, I don't trust it. You know what I mean? Like, our hair is literally, like, a representation of our soul in so many ways. Um, but even though you have coarse hair or thick hair, you still deserve to be treated with kindness and patience and dignity. I need and deserve kindness, care, and softness, right? My hair is not difficult. My hair is not difficult. The culture just doesn't like my hair. And it could be made easier if they... That's another, another conversation for another day. It doesn't want to be my hair. It doesn't want to be over-manipulated. It wants to be free. My hair wants to be close to me. My hair coils into itself and curls into my head like, Alicia, I love you so much. And I'm like, no, get away from me. Get away from me. 
<laughs> you know? And this is my personal journey. Everybody don't have to feel this way, and that's fine. I have not always loved my hair, but my hair has always loved me. Even coming through the perm. Like, girl, we're here. You keep giving us chemicals, but we're going to grow back strong. My hair has always loved me, and I have not always loved my hair. And I want to love it better. I have not always loved my hair because I have not always loved myself. We worry about, like, self-love and things like that. But all our lives, we've been taught to hate ourselves. All our, and we wonder why we don't love ourselves or love our hair or love our, our body, our feet, our, our hips, our legs, because we're taught to hate ourselves. But one thing I want to say to you is your hair is not the problem. You are not the problem. You never were. You've never been the problem. They, they condemn those they don't understand. What makes them feel inferior? What they can't control or make money off of? They make you the problem to be solved when you don't need to be solved. So they teach us to condemn ourselves. I have since cut my hair off and I love it. Um, I even felt some guilt again, cutting it again, right? There is community and connection with my hair that you miss, right? The care that you receive, sitting as a child in between your parents' lap, compliments and things that you miss, right? I'm human. I like, I like to be complimented. You know, people complimenting on your hair, like, oh my God, your hair is so nice. Now when people see me, they're like, oh, you cut your hair. Oh, that's interesting. I, I don't think that people know how to how to take it, right? And I'm lucky I do have some people in my life that are like, oh my God, I love your hair short. You're cute. You're cute in anything, right? But it's usually a shock to people initially. Um, so there are still some insecurities that I'm still working through, right? But there is care that I can receive in different ways. I might not get the hair done, right? But even someone cutting my hair is still care. Um, my mother will r rub her hand on my bald head and say that it reminds her of my pop pop. I love that. I love that. Um, I anoint my head with oil in the morning after my shower. I take time to massage my scalp. I find nourishment for my soul in other ways now that I, that I may have not had the energy to before because my hair is short, right? I have time to do more, to take care of myself in different ways. Choosing to be free will cost you, right? Count the cost. People won't like me or my hair. It just is what it is. People won't like me or my hair. That's literally their issue. <laughs> but I'm not living for them. That's the beauty of it. I'm not living for them, right? I love myself and I'm learning to love myself more than the lie of belonging. This lie of being palatable or consumable or, you know, not rock rocking the boat. It, that costs. That costs. What It both costs. Being free and going along with what they say. Being free, though, is more rewarding to me. I can deal with the, you know, the, the first feeling of disappointment from people, but what I can't deal with is years of not belonging to myself, of always belonging to somebody else, right? My hair defies the rules of gravity and their limited understanding of beauty. I'm out of this world, honey. You're out of this world. You're not, you're not easily understandable, and that's beautiful. And that's beautiful. There is no ugly stage. That doesn't exist. There's no ugly stage of hair, right? Beauty is beauty. Beauty doesn't, doesn't require length for it to be beautiful. Trying to conform is painful, restricting, and my, inher my hair invites me to be free like her. And that's why I love my hair. That's why I love my hair. So a few meditations or you know, takeaways from this conversation that I'm gonna share with you before we wrap this up. Number one, my hair loves me so much it wants to curl into itself and into me. My hair loves the strands, my, the, each strand loves every other strand so much that it curls into each other. And when I'm detangling my hair, it's like I'm separating them from their friends. You know, these are just some thoughts. Um, my hair is inviting me to defy convention, to be free, to take up space. Who does me shrinking? Who does me shrinking and arresting myself serve? Who does me fitting into puffs, into hairstyles that don't feel good to me? Who does that serve? Maybe me for a little bit. I get, I get acceptance for a little bit. But after a while, I lose sense of myself. I deserve kindness, care, gentleness. My pain and response to roughness are not the problem. I am not too sensitive. I am human, precious, and deserving of care and love. I am tender. And I deserve tenderness. I allow others to care for me. It's okay to ask for help, whether that's information or people just doing your hair for you. Allow others to care for you when you desire. Be help and helped by community. Be held, excuse me, and helped by community. Your hair is art. Express yourself. It belongs to you 
and you alone. When you are healing or dealing or tired, allow yourself to be covered and cared for. It's okay to rest. It's okay to get a protective style or whatever that means in real life, right? To be protected, to be held, to take a break, to ask for help from your community. There are parts of us that want to assimilate, but the part of us that is real will always come forth at some point. At some point, the real me will be seen and want love and care. And it's up to me to give myself that love and care. And the last thing I want to share is that you, me, all of us are lovely in all forms. No matter your hair texture, your skin color, your eye color, none of that. Your size, it don't matter. Your expression of yourself, you have always been worthy. You are always enough. You are always enough. You were always enough. And you are always enough. You will be always enough. So that's my hair story. Um, I loved it. This was fun. But I hope that you were able to take something away from this, no matter what your hair looks like, no matter what you decide to do. You can perm your hair if you want to. I'm not judging you, right? But make sure you're doing it for you. And I also want to give grace to those who are, uh, who are surviving, making the decisions they don't want to make because they have to survive in a world, sadly, that it was in a world that says that we are not enough unless we show up that way. Um, I'm sending so much love to you. You are doing the best that you can. Don't let nobody shame you for doing what you got to do to survive, okay? I see you, I love you, and I'll talk to you in the next video. Bye.